Hello, I'm Dave Mowitz, and welcome to Successful Farming. On today's program, I'm heading to a dealership dispersal auction to track the current values of four-wheel drive tractors. Then we feature a beautifully restored International 560 on ageless iron. The shark farmer, Rob Sharkey, is back offering his unique perspective on agriculture. And after these brief messages, Successful Farming's Advanced Technology Editor, Lori Bedord, covers the growing phenomena of women in precision agriculture. So please stay tuned. Precision agriculture is the key to sustainable and profitable food production today and will only increase in importance going into the future. As farmers increasingly turn to technology to manage every aspect of their operation, having skilled people on the front line will be more important than ever. While this field is typically dominated by men, the four young women that follow are proving it doesn't take feats of strength and speed to help farmers and retailers be successful in the precision ag field. It takes preparation, confidence, and smarts. I grew up on a farm. We um, raise cotton, corn, soybeans. I'm the sixth generation. So my role as precision coordinator within H&R means that I act as the communicator among the precision ag group. We have seven precision specialists across our company and we're fairly spread out. The closest specialist to me is about an hour to 70 miles away. So I'm the communicator amongst the group. I make sure that everyone has what they need as far as documents, training, um, support guides, anything that comes from the reps that needs to be sure it's distributed. And then also when it comes to internal processes, I help to guide and oversee that we're doing business internally as efficiently as possible. Uh, to make all of our lives a little easier. Um, here in Brownsville, I also service customers. So I go out on farms with, um, with our technicians or I go out on farms to address specific guidance issues that someone may have, yield monitors on combines, um, any other harvesting issues that may arise or planter clutches and, and just setting up all the electronics on machinery falls under my realm. Being a woman in precision in this area has been fairly easy. Um, a lot of the customers have known me my whole life and then I've had some great mentors that have been females in the ag industry here in West Tennessee that have, that have paved the way for me to be on the farm. I think my favorite part of it is when I go out to a customer that I've known a while and they, they've seen me grow up but they've not necessarily seen me on the farm because when you're busy you're in your own little world on your own farm and I get out there and I tell them I need to run the planter or I need to run this to make sure that we've got it working right. Okay, but I need to ride with you because I'm not real sure that you know how to drive this. And it's like, what? <laughs> I just fixed it. Surely I can drive it too. One lesson I've learned working at the farm is that work doesn't stop until the crop is out. And an understanding that when, when something is broken down on that farmer's operation and he's in the middle of planting or harvesting or spraying that, that you're affecting his livelihood. You know, to some of us, it's, it's still a job, but when it comes to our customers, it's their livelihood. And if we don't get out there and take care of them and get them fixed in a timely manner, they may miss a spraying window. They may have a rain cloud 10 minutes away that's gonna stop their operation when they could have been running and gotten that extra acre or two. And it's really important to be timely. And, and that's really something that we've learned at the farm and it's carried over into my work here at the dealership. I grew up on a cranberry farm in northern Wisconsin. Uh, my grandfather bought that marsh in 1939, um, scalped the trees off, uh, dug the ditches with shovels, uh, the first batch, and, and eventually had a, you know, a better, better machinery as, as he went on. But my grandpa and then my father have farmed that 
um, since 39. Um, grew up pulling maple trees and pulling willow trees and uh, kind of testing everything and then seeing how we could grow cranberries best. So I went to the University of Minnesota for biological systems and agricultural engineering. And after grad school, um, I came out to join Family Farms Group, where I've been working, I guess, for the last four years. I love a lot of things about my job. I love the agronomy peer group. I love getting to travel to a lot of different farms and learn a lot about many different crops. Um, cranberries are really fantastic, but there's a lot of really you know, brilliant things about corn and there's really neat things about cotton that I had no idea about growing up. Um, and so getting to learn a lot of different crops, it's really satisfying to be able to give people an answer. This is, this is what this cost, this is what this cost, this is what this made, this is what this made. Um, it's really satisfying to get to be out in the field with farmers because, you know, there had been kind of a slow start with precision ag and a lot of people are like, yeah, can that really help me? Um, getting them to the point where they can say, okay, good, finally we're getting something out of this and I just got a piece of actionable information. That makes me feel really good because um, you, you know it's there. People used to say, oh, I, you know, precision agriculture, you must be really smart. And I'd say, oh, I'm a little bit smart, but mostly really patient. Um, there's a lot of... Um, there's a lot of grinding that goes on, um, but, but it's all worth it in order, to, in order to help people grow better crops. So I did not grow up on a farm. Um, my grandparents had horses and donkeys and some other animals, and I really kind of fell in love with the rural life, I guess you could say, and really just wanted to continue in that. So when I graduated from high school, I ended up going to UC Davis and got my bachelor's in animal science and management and then a master's in agricultural economics and decided that I did not want to be a vet. I wanted to be around my own healthy animals and not everyone else's sick ones. So I start, sort of started looking around for something else to do that was in the industry. And I found agricultural and resource economics. And as part of that, um, part of the, that classwork, I also did some internships um, with our precision technologies department at school. And that's really where I fell in love with with Precision Ag. I've been an ag leader just a little over three years now. I cover Wyoming, Colorado, and Nebraska. And my primary responsibility is to develop the dealer network. By that, I mean sign new dealers, recruit new dealers, um, and also develop the dealers that I do have, including sales training and business planning. I think the most important thing that I do is to establish an open two-way communication, develop that honesty and trust between myself and my dealers, and also to help my dealers do that with their customers. Being a woman in agriculture has been really great, actually. I am happy to say that I haven't experienced any kind of discrimination or anything like that. Most of the farmers and dealers and everyone else that I deal with is very respectful and really wonderful people. South Dakota State University has a long history in precision agriculture. An agronomy professor worked with an ag engineering professor many years ago to offer the first class with a precision ag focus. As the years passed, the number of classes grew and the university started offering a minor in precision agriculture in 2014. The rapid increase in enrollment was a clear signal from students that they wanted to be a part of a highly skilled workforce in precision agriculture. One of those students is Lexi Schmidt. Currently a senior, Lexi is enrolled in the university's Agricultural Systems Technology Program with a minor in precision agriculture. We are a corn and soybean operation. Um, it's my dad and my uncle who farm together. I just kind of needed to figure out a way to move back to the farm and I needed to find a way to make myself unique. And so I started looking into ag schools and what degrees they offered. And um, I saw the Ag Systems Technology degree and I thought that would be a good fit for me. What I like most about being involved with the tech-related field is being involved with all aspects of agriculture. Um, I get the hands-on with new precision ag things. Uh, I get to be involved with farmers. I get to help my dad improve our operation. So I just get the best of all worlds. I've had two internships so far and I, I really I think it's helped me decide what part of agriculture I want to be involved in. I would like to be directly involved with farmers, so being at a dealership, and then my ultimate goal is to be the fifth generation farmer in our family. Over the next three years, the USDA projects that there will be nearly 16,000 annual openings in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, or STEM. 
all of which encompass the precision ag field. Whether it's implementing a nutrient management plan, installing precision equipment, developing maps, collecting soil samples, or providing training, it's clear Heather, Allison, Hope, and Lexi are a critical piece to the precision ag puzzle. Going forward, we must continue to encourage and nurture more young women who demonstrate an aptitude in these areas and make them aware of the myriad opportunities and rewards in precision agriculture. I'm in an inventory reduction sale that features an outstanding line of late model farm machinery and this John Deere 9470R drew my attention. What we have here is a 2015 model year tractor which is 379 hours on its tack. For equipment it comes loaded with five hydraulic outlets, front and rear suitcase weights, front and rear wheel weights, premium HID lights, 10 inch touch display. This is one of two such low R 9470s up for sale today. The other tractor has 435 hours. What I love about finding nearly two identical tractors is the sale price that they reach today is a solid indicator of what similar tractors are worth throughout the country. Doesn't matter if you're in Iowa as we are today or Washington State, Texas or Georgia. The internet has pretty much evened out the price plane table on late model machinery values. The one exception to this rule is Midwest machinery. Tractors, combines, and self-propelled sprayers from the Midwest seem to fetch the top-end prices. As it is perceived, they are better cared for. So what these two four-wheel drives sell for today provides a strong guide of what such tractors are worth. To confirm that, I'm going to go talk to a representative of Sullivan Auctioneers, the firm putting on today's sale, before these tractors sell. We're talking with Matt Sullivan of Sullivan Auctioneers. We're looking at this Deer 9470R. This is a 2015 low hours. It's got to be bringing stronger prices than they were a couple years ago. Yeah, I, I think that uh, we're very optimistic about this sale and about this tractor. Um, I, I think that I don't know where else you where else you can go to find a tractor that size with that kind of hours on it. Now help me a little bit here. In 14, well certainly in 15 and 16, we were loaded with four wheel late model four wheel drive tractors. Have their numbers gone down? I think that the, the dealers have not sold the new ones like they had been for a while. So the used ones with low hours are, are extremely desirable. And I think that, uh, you know, I think it'll be a good sale on them. So this is a 15, again, low hours. Do you have any idea of ranges that it might go for? Yeah, I think, you know, I hope to see the tractor bring, you know, roughly 225 to 245,000, I think would be a great price for the tractor. Thanks for the information, Matt. Let's watch the John Deere 9470 RSL. Here we go, 175, 157 to to get it, 175, 175, 224. The bidding just finished on my 9470, which brought a final price of $224,000. Now, how does that compare to the sale of recent similar tractors that have sold? The most solid comparable I can quote are dealer asking prices from Deere's dealer website, machinefinder.com. And bear in mind, these are asking prices and as such will be higher. 
At the time of this sale, just 33 2015 9470s were on dealer's lots. See, that's the beauty of websites like MachineFinder.com is that you can select machines by model, year, hour, location, and specifications. So I narrowed my search to 9470s with similar hours to the machine that sold today, about 379 to 491 hours. Just 10 tractors popped up. Their asking prices ranged from 249,000 up to 309,000. Now, knowing such prices, which can give you a great solid peace of mind when you go bidding at an auction or go negotiating with a dealer. Now, for more information on Sullivan Auctioneers, go to their website at SullivanAuctioneers.com and you can catch my machine insider equipment price trend analysis and every issue of successful farming. See you next week on another Steel Deals Report. Farm shows. How can you not like these places? I mean, look at all the stuff. It's a place where a farmer can go, he can wander through, see all these different technologies, these different equipment. And they've also got combines and tractors where you can get back to your five-year-old self. You can crawl up there and you can push the buttons, you can turn the wheel, you can pull the levers. There's nothing better. Farm shows are funny. There's a different subculture here. There's different ways to go about it. A lot of farmers will come in first thing they'll do is scout around for a bag because they got to get a bag to put all this free stuff in. Probably within about 15 minutes they've got it full. Also when you're walking along there's kind of a side eye thing you do. You want to check out the booth but you don't want to make eye contact with a salesman. But inevitably you just have to do it. You get that eye contact with a salesman and you get the question, where are you from? Now when I was a kid, farm shows used to be all about the hats. You get a free hat and you thought you'd won the lottery. Seems like nowadays you can't even hardly give away hats. But yardsticks, still today, for some reason, yardsticks seem to be the end all be all at farm shows. Who even uses a yardstick anymore? I mean, if you're at home measuring for drapes, do you say, oh honey, can you go get the yardstick? No, it's the most antiquated piece of measurement equipment in the world. And if you get the yardstick that's actually solid, you've got gold right there. But farm shows are important because it gets you off the farm. I know how it is, I'm a farmer. I know how comfortable it is to stay within your fence rows. But we have to get off. We have to get out and talk to other people because that's where our customers are. When you go to these farm shows, a lot of times they're in bigger cities. I'd encourage you not just to go from your hotel to the farm show, to a restaurant. I'd encourage you to get out a little bit. Go to a grocery store. Strike up a conversation with someone at the meat counter. Ask them, you know, what are their concerns when they're buying food? I think you'll be really surprised at the answers. I'm Rob Sharkey, host of the Shark Farmer Podcast. You can find my podcast on sharkfarmer.com. You can find more stuff like this on agriculture.com slash TV. Our Age Design Feature Tractor this week is a Farm All 560 Turbo owned by Kenny Ekstrom of Odeboat, Iowa. Kenny, you saw this sitting in a shed someplace and had always wanted to have one of these tractors, is that right? Yeah, I've wanted one of these since I was a little younger because there was a lot of them in our neighborhood. Right, Western Iowa. Western Iowa with turbos on them and I thought they were neat, they sounded cool and I drove by this place several times when I was going to my work and I could see it sitting out of the oh. shed. One day I thought I'd just stop and ask the guy if he might want to sell it. And, well, I might, and he says, uh, give me some time, and so I gave him a couple weeks, and I went back, and we made a deal, and I got it. Now, this tractor was not in the condition we find it now. No, it was not. It was one big, massive oil and fuel leak. <laughs> it was a mess. Yes. And uh, we did some, a lot of fixing on it. We did not have to overhaul the motor. But we had the head off and put a different head on it, and went through the injection pump and the injectors right. and put a different turbo on it. So talk about the turbo, but the 560 was not ever sold as a turbo. No, it, it came without a turbo on it, but you could buy it through the parts department as a kit, like aftermarket from International Harvester at the time. And they had a kit with all the parts that you needed, even the exhaust pipe with the curve on it. So you like the extra power because you, you, yeah. you run this on a lot of tractor rides, don't you? Yes, I do. And there's some hills, and we use the power. Do you? Yep. 
you have to talk a little bit about this because this is kind of a custom job that you have when it comes to the seating arrangement. Yeah, a uh, blacksmith friend of mine down in Denison, uh, Joe's Welding, made this, these steps and this seat for tractor riding and then it's made so it can be taken off and on. So my wife and I ride on this and we have a real good time. She grew up on a farm driving tractors so she enjoys it. So, yes. Yep. So, uh, and even the uh, the seat has shock absorbers. Yeah, I got shocks on both sides. I've been looking at double seats on tractor rides and I saw a guy had shocks on both sides to stabilize it. Right. You know, otherwise you're kind of rocky. So I went with that. We got the stiffest ones I could find and <laughs> so it helps a lot. So what's the fun of the ride for you? Just seeing the scenery. You get driving about 14, 15 mile an hour. You get a chance to really look at stuff and actually see things and you don't have to be going full bore wide open. Yes. You know, it's, it's very relaxing. For more information about Kenny Ekstrom's 560 Turbo and other Aegis Iron Feature tractors, go to agriculture.com slash TV. Please join us next week for another outstanding show. I sit down with Tom Rogers of Firestone Tire to get some practical advice on selecting tractor tire replacements. And then our engine man, Ray Bohax, offers another one of his invaluable repair and maintenance tips. I spend the day at auction to see what Case IH quad track tractors are worth these days. And then we feature a great shop storage loft idea on all around the farm. See you next week right here on Successful Farming. Hi, I'm Dave Mowitz. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, hit subscribe right here if you haven't already and click that little bell right here to be notified when we post a new video and click here to see more great episodes from Successful Farming Television.